Something I've been learning about more and more as I create videos for this channel is about the way that Nintendo games have made their way out of Japan. The Family Computer, or Famicom as the NES is known in its home country, had a library of over a thousand titles, and while many of those were never released worldwide, most of the ones that did were largely unchanged when localized for other markets. Sure, there were some naming adjustments, like Akumajo Dracula becoming Castlevania, or some censorship, like in Legend of Zelda how the Bible was changed to the Book of Magic, but most of the classic games we associate with the NES are nearly identical to the ones first released on its Japanese counterpart. But there were a few instances where, for a variety of reasons, certain titles were more dramatically altered in order to appeal to a more Western audience. In the 80s and 90s, consumers would have no idea that these games have been altered from their original forms, but in recent years, the internet has shined a great big light on the Nintendo library, and now, these cross-continental game connections are more apparent. I've created a list of 8 NES games that were total reskins of different Famicom titles. As always with these kind of list videos, I'm only scratching the surface about what a lot of these games have to offer, some of which I've already reviewed in depth already, and some of which I will review more in the future. So stay tuned for that. All right, let's get to it. The most famous example of this phenomena is Mario 2. As kids, we all played this as a sequel to Super Mario Brothers, and sure, maybe we thought the enemies and gameplay style were a little odd, but hey, you are playing as Mario characters. Why would this be anything else? Well, once the internet was in full swing, the news broke that our beloved Mario 2 was actually a reskin of an Arabian-themed game called Yume Kuju Doki Doki Panic, and our collective nostalgic minds were fully blown. If you've ever played Mario 2, the gameplay in Doki Doki Panic is exactly the same, but there are a lot of subtle and not-so-subtle differences to everything else. First of all, no Mario and friends. Not only that, but you can't switch out their counterparts between every stage. Only once you've completed all three stages in a level can you then try someone new. But then they have to start at the beginning of the game. What? Why? Also, while each person has different abilities, for some reason none of them can run. Weird. While the enemies are mostly the same, some of the items have shifted so that the potion is now a magic lamp. These capsule things are now clown faces? And this turtle shell is... you're killing me here, guys. The bonus game is present, but instead of the Mario crew hanging out, it's just this blank green screen, and I don't know if I'm lucky or what, but I am cashing in on this Japanese version. Pay up, pay up! The biggest difference for me, though, is the sound, which has this weird robotic effect when enemies get hurt. And is that a train horn I hear? If you're like me and you love Mario 2 but have never tried Doki Doki Panic, give it a shot. It's like peering into a Berenstein Bears style alternate reality where nothing's quite how you remember it. A really obscure title on the system that absolutely fits the bill was Trolls in Crazy Land, a game that was only released in Europe and Australia. Here you play as a random troll, confidently strutting around in his altogether glory as you fight animals, clowns, and racist caricatures. Well, this is actually a reskin of a game called Doki Doki Yuenshi Crazy Land Daisukusen, which roughly translates to Thump Thump Amusement Park. Here you control a little kid wearing a baseball helmet, and what's weird about this is that as you take damage, your weapon becomes stronger, and when you're close to death, you now kick a soccer ball. I guess a baseball would have been too small for a weapon, or maybe this kid is just an all-around sports master like Casey Jones. Otherwise, these games are completely identical. There's a lot of potential in either version as the graphics and sprite work are really solid, and the music is catchy as all hell, but there's some questionable platform detection when it comes to jumping around, everything seems to knock you back to your death, and enemies take so many hits. It makes what would be a hidden gem on the system come across as more of a tedious, frustrating mess. One of the hardest games to explain to someone today is Yo Noid, a title starring the one-time Domino's anti-mascot who hates pizzas for some reason. Yeah, that was a thing, and making corporate licensed titles was something companies were way into back in the day, with other examples produced for the NES like Spot or Mick Kids. As this title was developed in Japan, it's no surprise that the original game did not feature a deranged yo-yo wielding rabbit man, but rather a masked ninja chucking hawks. However, it's not just the main character who got an overhaul, Yonoid features all new enemies, stage backgrounds, and even music. 
Unfortunately, they also both contain one of my all-time least favorite minigames. In Yo Noid, it's a pizza eating contest where you tactically choose a higher or lower number of pizzas to eat, while in the Famicom version, it's a weapon-based battle. The effect is exactly the same though, and this unskippable snorefest can take over 3 minutes to get through, often lasting way longer than the level it follows. Also, there's no real reward for winning other than points. Why? God please make it end. While the music, graphics, and gameplay of either take is decent enough, that has to be weighed against the fact that your character dies in one hit. That's it. One errant bird or fish and you're done for. Boo! Here's an odd one, Kid Clown. Not every example of this process is putting a popular license over an unpopular or region specific one, and Kid Clown is a perfect example of this. It's actually a reskin of a Mickey Mouse game, Mickey Mouse 3 Yume Fusen, which translates to Mickey Mouse 3 Balloon Dreams. Apparently, the developers at Kimco had the rights to Disney licenses in Japan, while Capcom held them in North America, so when they wanted to bring Balloon Dreams over to the West, they inexplicably swapped out Mickey for this Bobby Hill turned Juggalo. The story absolutely makes more sense than the original, kind of following a dream-based premise that leads you to familiar locations from classic Mickey cartoons. The NES version feels much more random, something about Kid Clown's family being kidnapped by the Nightmare to keep Kid from finding a vault of red rubber noses. Man, that is a stretch. This game is actually pretty fun, incorporating a balloon as both a weapon and a platform, and tossing in some decent designs and some impressive graphical effects. A title I reviewed recently was the event minigame compilation Snoopy Silly Sports Spectacular. Like Kid Clown, this title was developed by Kemco, and similarly, it's a reworking of another Disney game called simply Donald Duck. It's basically six competitions taking place against various Italian backdrops. There's a sack race, a boot throwing, a pole vault, a pogo hurdle, a pizza balancing act, and a push each other into the water event. None of these are bad by any means, just super simple, and although Pogo and Pole Vault take a bit of work to get the timing right, the other four events are stupid easy. The main differences between the two games are just the title screens and the characters, with Woodstock replacing one of the triplets, and Snoopy's brother Spike swapping out for Daisy. It's definitely a preference thing for this one, but personally, I like the Donald game better, as the little animations seem more specific to his character, and there's something really funny to me about him and his girlfriend pushing each other into the canal. But wait, the boys at Kimco weren't done yet, because they also pulled the switcheroo with old Bugs Bunny's Crazy Castle. Yep, this was originally a Roger Rabbit game when it was released in Japan, but a totally different design than the Who Framed Roger Rabbit title we got in the States. If you've never played Crazy Castle, it's a very simple puzzle platformer where you guide bugs through these doorways while avoiding Sylvester and Yosemite Sam. It's similar to classic arcade titles like Burger Time or even Pac-Man, where you mostly avoid enemies while collecting items in order to progress to the next level. Roger Rabbit is completely identical except you play as a different looking bunny and now the Looney Tunes guys are all weasels. Cool. Not much more to say about this one, except that if you've never tried either of these, you ain't missing much. One of my favorite games growing up was Power Blade, a Mega Man clone of sorts where you can select different stages and run around tossing boomerangs at robo enemies. It's a fantastic title, with excellent controls, rad enemy designs, a pumped up soundtrack, and just an overall fun mix of exploration and action platforming. And here's an example of not just a simple sprite swap, but a complete and total renovation. The Famicom title Power Blazer features the same music and a similar level choice option, but now your character has been reduced from beer chugging gym teacher to Halloween costume Mega Man, who swapped E-Tanks for donut buffets. He does still chuck boomerangs, but both him and his weapon move so slow and jump so short that simply moving through the stages is a real chore. Speaking of stages, they are completely and totally different from Power Blade, eschewing the forking paths to find your contact design for a much more linear approach. I'm kind of in awe. This is a completely different game in almost every way, and none of them are good. The combat is cheap, the platforming is atrocious, the level design is bland, and if I didn't immediately recognize the music, there's no way, no way I'd mistake this for Power Blade. Amazing. Avoid Blazer at all costs. Keeping in the Mega Man mold, it's Wampum! 
You play as Soaring Eagle, who needs to navigate these elemental themed stages to do... I actually have no idea what the plot of this game is, honestly. Like Mega Man, there's a stage select, some screen scrolling between areas, and some magic and weapon upgrades found in the levels and after beating each boss. It's not quite as polished as Power Blade, and while there are a lot of neat ideas here, and some great graphics and sound, the controls and hit detection just aren't complete enough to make this much more than a one-time playthrough. Oddly enough, Wampum is a reskin of Sayuki World 2, which itself was the sequel to Sayuki World, which was never released outside of Japan. Sayuki World 2 is very heavily influenced by Chinese mythology, with your character resembling the iconic monkey man Sun Wukong, who served as the inspiration for Goku from Dragon Ball amongst others. I guess the developers thought that'd be a bit too obtuse for North American audiences at the time, so they fully committed to what they thought would be successful over there, a western-themed game starring a Native American kid. Alright. Aside from the main character swap, everything is exactly the same, even leaving you to navigate the great bamboo forest of New Mexico. Nailed it. And that's all I could think of for now. There's others where certain sprites or backgrounds or items were altered slightly in the move from Japan to the rest of the world, but most of those are pretty subtle and less of an overall reskin of the original game. As always, if y'all can think of some more, put it in the comments, and if there's enough to make a part two, we'll come back to that later. If you like my channel and want to join the other cool cats watching weekly Big Awards bonus videos, head on over to patreon.com slash bigawards and consider adding your support to the cause. It means a lot and goes a long way toward my distant dream of one day doing this YouTube thing part to full time. And if streaming is your thing, come join the stream squad for a new game every Thursday, 9pm Eastern Standard Time, here on YouTube. It's a real soul-shattering experience, I promise. Until next time, thanks for watching.